<coughs> so let me start by um, recalling the Erdős Corrado theorem. You have two integers, r and n, and r is less than n over 2. r can be any fixed number. I, I like to think of r as n over 3. But And you have a family of sets. They're subsets of the numbers 1 up to n, and they're all of si size r. So this is just my notation for uh, subsets of size r from the n set. And A is intersecting. So if A1 and A2 belong to A, I'm not good at the calligraphy, so this is a curly A, then uh, their intersection is non-empty. OK, so it's an intersecting family. Every two sets intersect. And the question is, how large can A be? So uh, the erdős corrado theorem says that the size of A is at most, well, let's see. If you want to build uh, an intersecting family from R sets, what's the simplest thing you can do? Contain the element 1. Right. F uh, no, the simplest thing you can do is to contain the element 2. No. <laughs> you, you fix an element and take all, sets, all R sets that contain it. And in that case, you get n minus 1, choose R minus 1. And indeed, that's the best you can do. And uh, we shall note that this is an r over n proportion of all sets, which makes sense, because if you choose an r set at random, what's the probability it contains 1? Well, it contains r elements out of the n, so you have probability r over n of containing 1. Now, <coughs> I wrote in my abstract that this is a cornerstone of uh, uh, extremal combinatorics. This theorem you can generalize in a million different directions. So say, what if the intersections are of size at least 2? What if the intersection has to be even? What if the intersection is a prime number? What if instead of sets, we take subspaces of some linear space and demand that the intersection be non-trivial? What happens if we take subgroups? What happens if we take geometric objects? There are a million different ways of generalizing this. <coughs> One way. Um, is let's forget that the sets are of size r. Let's say that a is a subset of, well, I write it 0, 1 to the n. I just mean all subsets of n. Well, then clearly, uh, now you can do a, a lot more. Uh, you notice that r is less than n over 2, because if r is greater than n over 2, every two sets intersect. But now you can do many uh, things which are more interesting than just picking a point. But it's clear that the size of A is at most uh, half of 2 to the n, because you never have a set on its complement if it's an intersecting family. Well, that doesn't seem very interesting. But we can make it a bit more interesting if we put a measure on the space. So now, I'm, throughout this talk, we're going to think of 0, 1, n, 0, 1 to the n as a measure space with a product measure. The, the measure of a point is just p to the number of ones in that point times 1 minus p, the power of number of zeros in that point. So you flip a coin n times, and it's a biased coin. It comes up heads with probability p. And you ask, what's the probability of getting a specific vector? That's the measure of that set or that vector. And the measure of a family is just <coughs> the probability that the, your a uh, string of uh, coin tosses falls in the family. And now you can ask, well, what's the, what's the maximum measure of an intersecting family? So if A is intersecting, how large can the family be according to that measure? Well, once again, what will be the analog of R is at most n over 2? Let's say that P is at most 1 half. Because if P is 51%, and I take all strings that have n over 2 plus square root n log n ones in them. That's clearly an intersecting family, and its measure is close to 1 if, p, if n is large and p is 0 0.51. So to make this interesting, p has to be at most 1 half. And it turns out that in that case, well, best you can do is once again fix a point, take all sets that contain it. What's the 
measure of that family, it's precisely the probability that the coin corresponding to that point comes up heads. It's exactly p. And that's the best you can do. And that's the theorem I want to talk about today. OK? It's not a generalization. It's a well. It's it's very similar to this, but it's not a generalization. But thank you for reminding me. R over n. This is p in what sense? In in the sense that if you take the p measure on the cube, you're focusing on sets of size p times n. So here you're focusing very strongly on sets of size r. So you might say r over n is p. And indeed, the first proof that I'll show you utilizes this fact. And so if time permits, I'll show you four and a half proofs of this theorem. And we should ask ourselves, why do we want to see many proofs of one theorem? So <clears throat> well, let's think of this as a competition between these proofs. Um, so what are we going to judge them for? First of all, correctness. <laughs> <laughs> That's first and foremost. So zero, yeah. Yeah, correctness is a very important parameter. Um, I'd like to say also beauty, because uh, there's no place for ugly mathematics. I forget whose quote that is, but uh, it's nice if, uh, if a proof is an aesthetic proof, a proof. We look at it and say, this should be a book proof. But one thing we should see is, does this proof generalize well? So I told you there are a, a huge plethora of different generalizations of Erdos Corrado. Can this proof be pushed through to prove other theorems? Uh, <coughs> does this proof teach us something new about this statement? And uh, does this proof give us uniqueness, that the only uh, unique case is fixing one point? And another nice thing is, does this proof give us stability? So it turns out that if you have an intersecting family whose size is very close to this, and I'm not going to tell you what very close means, then its structure has to be very close to uh, the structure of the true extremal family. So that's called a robustness result. And here, too, you have robustness. If you have an intersecting family whose measure is p minus epsilon, then up to O of epsilon, uh, your family, the, the symmetric difference between your family and some family, which is the principal family, fixing one, is order of epsilon. So does your proof uh, easily yield the uh, stability, or easily or not so easily yield stability results. OK, so the first proof is uh, going to infinity and back. So this I, it appears in writing the first time in a paper of Irit, uh, Dinur, and Muli Safra. But I think uh, I heard this from Noga beforehand. But anyhow, so. A is sitting inside 0, 1 to the n. And let's say, let's say mu, mu 0 0.3 of A is uh, 0 0.4. Uh, and I'm going to sh reach a contradiction. So the first thing I do is I embed this example in a much larger example. So I look at A times Cartesian product with 0, 1 to the big N minus N. And big N is huge. It's really big N. This is, sits inside 0, 1 to the big N. And this is sort of strange. Why? I mean, if I'm keeping the exact same structure, what the, why would I do this? And this is also an intersecting family. So if every two vectors here have some coordinate where they agree, where they're both 1, Obviously, this holds in, in the product also. But here, um, so now this is what the, oh, and one more thing. In all these, uh, uh, in all these cases, uh, we always may assume that uh, A is upward closed. So if you have a set in A, add all its supersets. This will preserve the fact that it's an intersecting family. 
So since we're trying to give an upper bound on the size of A, you might as well assume that A is outward closed. So A looks something like this. And um, here is a simple fact. If you look at the density at a certain level, what percentage of the sets on that level belong to A? That's a monotone increasing function in the level. As you go up, up the, it, it's, that's a one-line proof, which I'm not going to do. The density will go up. Now, if we're looking at mu 0.3 and n is huge, then the only thing that we care about, the only thing, the only place where the action is happening is 0.3 times n plus minus square root n log n. Okay, so it, saying that the measure is 0.4 means that on this narrow slice, the measure is, th that, that's where all the measure of the cube sits, right? Anything that happens above or beneath this has negligible measure. So the measure here is uh, going to be um, on average 0.4. So, and since this is an increasing function, definitely at level uh, 0.35n, which is way outside this belt, uh, the density is close to 0.4, right? So I'm fixing one, one level uh, up here, but that contradicts the erdos corrado theorem because uh, 0 0.4 is more than uh, 0.35 n divided by n. So I found some level where I have, if I restrict to that level, it's an intersecting family, but its density is greater than what erdos corrado theorem allows. So the theorem from one level uh, implies the theorem on the measure version of the theorem which to me is a bit surprising because I'd assume that the, it would, the, the easy implication would be the other way, that if I, know, if I know this, I can prove this. But actually, I don't, I don't know how to prove Erdos Corrado just from using this. Okay, So it's, it's interesting that the implication goes in that direction. Well, what was the reason for choosing n large enough when gravity? Oh, because, uh, because I use the fact that all the measure sits that if I go to 0 0.35 n, then I'm already sure that I'm way past the point where, where the measure has to be 0 0.4. Yeah. Oh, 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 sorry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Peter. OK, so that's proof number one. OK, uh, proof number two. Proof number two is. Uh, Right, right. I, this, uh, yeah. Uh, I thought you were going to tell us of four incorrect proofs equivalent to one correct proof. <laughs> no, 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 no. The, the proofs are all correct. But yeah, this, so a drawback of this proof is that it uses the, yeah. But I said also one, one thing we're looking for, does it shed some light? Do we learn something? It's interesting to note that the, the level-wise statement implies the measure statement. Um, OK, so the next proof, uh, maybe many of you have seen Katona's proof of erdos corrado theorem. Uh, so I once, <coughs> I wrote a paper where I gave the, I, I took Katona's proof and I just changed it a bit to get this statement. And uh, then I, I had a student who came to one of my courses and he said, uh, your paper is way too complicated. Here's the right way to do it. So that student was uh, Yuval Filmus. He's a faculty member at the Technion. So here's, uh, I'm going to show you Yuval's proof. So once again, we're given A. <coughs> so um, first of all, uh, put the elements 1, 2, up to n at random. 
on the unit circle. OK? 1, 3, 2, 17, and OK. Then next, uh, choose or OK. Let, let's let's uh, do it in a, at first in a different order. So uh, choose an interval of length p. No, of length p on the unit circle. So the, I'm assuming that the circumference is 1, and you choose a, an interval of length p. And now I throw the numbers 1 at up to n at random. And what's the probability? So what's the probability that the set of x is such that x fall in this random interval? Uh, what's the probability that this belongs to A? So I claim that this is precisely mu p of A. Because it belongs to A. Because for each element, the probability of it falling in the interval is independent of all other elements. It's p. So I'm choosing each element with probability p. What's the probability that what shows up belongs to a? That's exactly mu p of a. But now um, we can, so I said first do this and then do this. But now uh, switch uh, two and one. So first of all, I'm going to put the elements on the circle. And now I'm going to choose an interval. And, and so clearly, the, <laughs> the probability of this doesn't change. It uh, doesn't matter. But note that uh, if I1, if, uh, let's call this event, event, if event holds for i1 and i2, if I have two different intervals such that w the content of those intervals belongs to A, they have to intersect. It means that i1 intersection i2 is non-empty. Right? If I have two disjoint intervals, their content is disjoint, two disjoint sense sets can't belong to my family. So the question is, if I choose, uh, if I have, so now I fixed the numbers 1 up to n, and I'm looking at the measure of intervals. What's the probability that the interval will, con uh, the content of the interval will be in my family? And I'm told that uh, all the intervals for which this holds are intersecting. So if I have one interval, for which it holds, all other intervals, w w let's say this interval starts at x and ends at x plus p, then all other intervals for which it holds have to intersect this. So every interval for which it holds has to start somewhere between x minus p and x plus p, right? And uh, here I'm using the fact that p is less than 1 half. So that gives me a measure of 2p, but note that if if one interval, uh, if it holds for one interval, it can't hold for the interval that starts immediately after it. So I have uh, an interval of length 2p where all the starting points are, are uh, um, candidates, but, I, uh, but uh, I can divide it into, into, I have a bijection where only one from each pair can belong. So the measure is in 2p, it's only 1p. Th this is the interval from x minus p to x plus p of all possible starting points, then we know that if a certain point, if the event holds for y, it can't hold for y plus p. So we have a subset which is uh, at most half of this interval, so the probability is at most p. So the, so the probability of this is at most p. OK, so that, that was proof number two. Uh, so what do we learn from proof number two? That you can, in some sense, you can uh, partition the space into parts 
such that in each part the measure of your uh, uh, of uh, of your family is at most p. So we can think of a, a uh, if think think of the all possible cyclical orders for each cyclical order, the measure of your uh, the measure of your family is at, at most p. So we're we're dividing our world into parts, and in each part it's at most p. And this is a use a useful uh, concept, and it can be generalized to other settings. What's very frustrating is that this can't be generalized to two intersecting even. So there are... Uh, the two intersecting case is much more complicated. No, so for two intersecting, the answer here is p squared. I mean in the eldest corridor. Well, OK, so for two intersecting, uh, it depends on the value of r. And, and also, it depends on the value of p, so up to p equals one third, the answer is fix two points and take everything that contains them. And between the third and two fifths, it's take three points and take everything, four points and take everything that has three out of those four points, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole uh, list of possibilities. And this proof, many people have tried to do Erdős Karadu for, for using this proof for um, two intersecting. And then the space doesn't decompose nicely into parts. So, in that sense, this proof, uh, that's one of the drawbacks of this proof. OK, so uh, on to proof 3 and proof 3.5. So it, it's what I said I'm counting it as a half proof. So now I'm going to show you two proofs, which they're essentially the, they're the same proof. But it takes time to translate one to the other. So this is a proof using. Fourier analysis or spectral properties. Uh, so <coughs> let's let's start by um, defining a function from zero one n to zero one, but in general to R, and it's just the the characteristic function of of A. So I have a function on my space and. Uh, it gives me one for points that are in my family and zero otherwise. And I want to uh, expand this function according to a nice ortho uh, orthonormal basis. So my space is a measure space, so there's a natural inner product. F inner product of G is just the expectation of F times G. So it's nice to take an orthonormal basis. This is It's a discrete space with two to the n points, so my basis is going to have 2 to the n elements. The space of functions on the space is also of dimension 2n. So here, here's how I define my functions. So let's start just with the two-point space, 0 and 1. And remember, the measure here is p. And from now till the end of the lecture, q is 1 minus p. Okay. So q is not uh, such that uh, 1 over q plus 1 over p equals uh, 2. Q is just 1 minus p. Definition, and uh, here's a function which I call chi i. It's a, this is representing the ith coordinate. Uh, here it's minus square root q over p, and here it's uh, square root of p over q. And I also have a function which is the one function which is one here and one here, and. If you look at this, you'll see this is an orthonormal basis for the space of functions on this two-point space. So clearly, they're orthonormal because q times this plus p times this is 0. So that means they're orthogonal to each other. And the expectation of each of these functions squared is 1, because this squared times q is p, and this squared times p is q. So p plus q is 1. So this is an orthonormal basis. And Everyone is, uh, yes, anyone who uh, has ever seen Walsh for years. Uh, but, but just note that uh, uh, as opposed to the case uh, p equals 1 half, this isn't a group. Uh, chi i squared isn't one of the functions in, in our uh, collection of functions. So it's not, it's not a character, really, but it's, uh, it's a generalization of the characters for the uh, group z2 to the n. 
And for any, if I is a subset of one up to n, then I define chi i to be, pardon me, a chi capital I to be the product of chi i, i and i. Okay, and the collection of all these uh, functions is, collection of these two to the n functions is an orthonormal basis to my space of functions. So now let's take f and expand it according to this uh, basis. So I'm going to write f equals sum ai chi i. And the formula, if you want to know what ai is, you just uh, take the inner product of, of f with chi i because it's OK? Now let's see some things. First of all, uh, what is A empty set? A empty set is the coefficient of the one function uh, <coughs> uh, in this expansion. So take f inner product with one. f is the uh, uh, characteristic function of the family A. What do we get? The measure of, the measure of A. This is. Mu, mu is going to denote the, uh, the measure of A. And uh, what happens if I look at the expectation of F squared, which is the inner product of F with itself? This is, well, since F is a 0, 1 function, this is also uh, the measure of A. And this is, if I take the inner product of this with my, itself, I get, by Parseval, I get the sum of ai squared. OK. I have a colleague who uh, used to teach discrete math. And one time he came to the class before the lesson, and one of the students had written blackboard number one, blackboard number two, blackboard number three. There was a hint for him how to <laughs> proceed. And, and he said that when he saw this, he immediately decided that indeed this is a good idea and he's going to try to proceed according to this. But after about 10 minutes, he forgot. And, <laughs> and yeah, so I, I'm very much like him. And it's not a coincidence because he was my advisor. So. But I'll try to not try to have some logic to the way in which I proceed from Blackboard to bra Blackboard. So now I'm going to look at two uh, vectors, x and y, which uh, are both, they belong to 0, 1, to the n. And each of these is going to be random distributed according to our measure. So both x and y are distributed according to mu p. However, they are, they, uh, they are going to be dependent. So I want them each to be distributed going to MP, mu p, but I want them to be disjoint. I want them to have this joint support. Now, there's only one way to do that. The uh, pair of coordinates x i, y i can either be 0, 0, or 0, 1, or 1, 0, but they can't be 1, 1. And if I want xi to be distributed mu p, this has to happen with probability p, and this has to happen with probability p. And then there's no choice but to let this happen with probability 1 minus 2p. And this is why you can only do this if p is less than 1 half. Now, um, but, and, th and the different coordinates are independent. xi and yi are independent of all the xj's and yj's for i different than j. <coughs> and now I can look at the expectation of uh, chi i a, yeah, chi i y i, oh, chi i x i times chi i a y i. So chi i is a function of x, but essentially it only depends on x i. Right? It only depends on the ith coordinate. So let's see if they're both uh, uh, um, 
If they're different, then, then I get a minus one. So I get a minus one with probability two p, and I get a q over p with probability one minus two p, and you calculate the expectation, and you get minus q over p. OK. And what can you tell me about the expectation of f of x times f of y? Well, forget the expectation. What can you tell me about f of x times f of y? x and y are disjoint. Yeah, yeah, zero. So it's 0. <laughs> and in particular, the expectation is 0. It's, it's a, this is a constant 0, so this is 0. On the other hand, well, I expand it. I write out the expansion of f, and I take the inner product. I, I just take all the inner products, and everything cancels out except, so I get some ai, oh, sorry, ai squared times the expectation of uh, chi i x chi i y. Um, to a, a product i and i. So for every every set i, uh, I have I have these expectations. But what what happens on different coordinates is independent. So I can I can uh, multiply it. But for one coordinate, it is dependent. So what I get here is some a i squared minus p over q. Is that what? Yeah, minus p over q to the power of the size of i. Minus p over q, you That's, oh, oh. Uh, no, no, it should be minus p over q. Yeah, it's minus p over q. OK, let's, let's do the calculation. You, you get, my, with probability 1 minus 2p, you get uh, minus 1 plus, uh, no, uh, no, I'm sorry, with probability 2p, uh, he, here you're getting a minus 1. So you get minus 2p plus 1 minus 2p times a p over q. OK, so you get q on the bottom, uh, minus 2q, minus 2pq plus p plus a minus 2p squared, so the minus p comes out, and you get 2 minus p minus q. So you get, which is 2 minus 1, which is 1. So minus p over q. Good. Uh, OK, so we have this. And this is, this is equal to 0. And now let's use what we know. So this is uh, the first term is mu squared. This comes from the a coefficient of the constant function. A empty set squ squared is mu squared. And now for every other, um, for, for every other, uh, these are all positive. And for every other set, what we have here is greater than minus p over q. p over q is a, a number which is smaller than 1. So minus p over q, if it's, so what I, let me write down what I mean. This is greater than uh, some i non-empty ai squared minus p over q. Right, because what I have here is some power of minus p over q. If it's a even power, it's positive. If it's a negative power, it's, it's uh, closer to 0. So this is definitely true. And this is uh, greater or equal to mu squared plus uh, minus p over q times, or th no, this is equal to mu squared minus p over q times mu minus mu squared. Because the sum of all, all the squares uh, is mu. And if I. Uh, remove this coefficient, I, I remove a mu squared. So the bottom line is that uh, mu squared minus p over q 
mu minus mu squared is less or equal to 0. And this, ju this just comes out to be mu is less or equal to p. OK, so this is a. Uh, Hmm. Uh, well, part of the intuition you'll get when I show you the other proof, which is isomorphic to this. Um, also, another thing, is, well, f from this proof, you can get both uniqueness and stability. You can get the, the only way. So when will you have equality here? We lost something when, uh, whenever we had a, a non-zero Fourier coefficient on a set of size larger than 2. So it tells you that this is tight when all the Fourier spectrum is on the empty set and on the first level. And if that's a Boolean function, you can show that it, it has to be concentrated just on an empty set and one singleton. So it tells you something about what the Fourier spectrum of an uh, intersecting family can look like. Um, OK, le let me show you another proof, which is it really is the same proof, but all, even though it looks a bit different. And yeah, so this proof is good for, uh, it's good for stability. And it's also, it generalizes to uh, other various settings. So if you want two intersecting, three intersecting, you can use this. Uh, so my, my biggest demon is the, a nice adaptation of this proof shows you that if it's two intersecting, you're less or equal, the measure is less or equal to p squared, provided p is less than one third. But we, between one third and, and two fifths, the, the next example kicks in. It's better to take, to fix four coordinates and take everything that has three out of the four. And that I don't know how to prove using Fourier analysis. So there's a certain range where, where this proof works well. And after that, I can't do it with Fourier. But nowadays, there are young, vigorous Fourier analysts who, who know how to do things which I, I failed doing before. So maybe they will succeed. So I, I think I told Avi that. You all know Mantel's theorem. Mantel's theorem is the simplest uh, uh, version of uh, um, wow. of Turin's theorem. That a triangle uh, graph that has more than n squared over four edges has to have a triangle. Now, uh, Gil, my advisor, says that uh, Mantel's theorem is a theorem which is very difficult not to prove. So. <laughs> No matter how you try to do it, somehow there are many different approaches and they all work. But I've been trying to do it for 20 years using Fourier analysis, and I've never managed. But now there's a bright young student from Bar Ilan University called Noam Lifshitz, and he astonished me by showing me a Fourier proof of uh, Mantel's theorem. So of course, it's the most complicated proof ever of Mantel's theorem. But it's very exciting because maybe it can be generalized to settings where the other proofs d uh, don't generalize. So I, I was very thrilled to see it. Yeah. So did I say his name? Noam Lifshitz. Yeah. Remember the name. You will hear more about him. OK, so um, this proof that I did here is essentially the proof of Hoffman's bound. What does Hoffman's bound? Hoffman's bound says that if you have a deregular graph whose uh, a minimum eigenvalue is, so if you have a deregular graph, the largest eigenvalue is d. And the smallest eigenvalue, let's call it lambda min. So the size of the largest uh, independent set divided by the total size of the vertex set is always at most mean minus d lambda min over d minus lambda min. Did I get this? Uh, yeah, lambda min is negative. So yeah. So I 
think this is correct. And, and the way you prove it is you do, you do spectral analysis. You, you take the, this, this is the proof of Hoffman's theorem. You take the characteristic vector of the independent set and you expand it in terms of eigenvectors of the graph. And this is the proof. Now, so I'm doing this proof for our graph. What graph? Is there a graph here? So there is a graph. Look at this graph. This is a graph on two vertices. But it's not a normal graph. It's a weighted graph. This has weight p, and this has weight q. And <coughs> so now, uh, what's an independent set in this graph? Well, this vertex is an independent set. Doesn't span. This is not an independent set because it spans an edge. So what's the measure of the largest independent set here? It's p. And but this isn't a regular graph. Well, if you uh, this measure is the uh, stationary measure of a random walk on this graph, which uh, when you're here, you go here with probability 1. And when you're here, you stay in your place with a certain probability, which we can calculate in, it would take us 10 seconds, or, or with a, a different probability, you move to here. So this is a stationary measure of some uh, uh, random walk. And if you put those weights on, on the edges, then the graph is regular. So th the weight out of here is 1, and the weight out of here is 1. And then you can, uh, and then you can apply Hoffman's bound. And, and d is 1, and lambda min is uh, minus p over q. And what you get is minus, you get p over q divided by 1 plus p over q, and that's p. So you get a, for this, this is a special case of the theorem where n is equal to 1. You get that the, using Hoffman's bound, you get that the largest independent set in this graph has measure p, which is not very surprising or thrilling. But everything tensors. When you take, when, when, when you take this, the big graph we're interested in is in fact a tensor product of this graph. The edges are, the adjacency matrix is the tensor of the adjacency matrix. The measure is the tensor of the measure. measure. The spectral, the, the orthonormal basis is the eigenvectors are the tensors of the eigenvectors. Everything tensorizes. And, and, and the set of eigenvalues is just a, a it's just this tensor to n times, so the minimal eigenvalue is, mi is, so any eigenvalue is just you take either 1 or minus p over q and multiply it. So these numbers that you see here are the eigenvalues, and the smallest eigenvalue is minus p over q. And, and most importantly, the definition of an independent set and the like. The definition of an independent set in, uh, tensorizes. And also, this uh, random walk, wh what you're doing, you're looking at a random walk where you move from one set, you have to move to a set with, which is disjoint from it. And this is precisely this pair x, y, that uh, you want this, the stationary measure as mu p, but you can only move to sets which are disjoint. So this Hoffman proof is this proof. Uh, so that's, that's why this is, this is a half. These together are one and a half proofs, or maybe they're even just one proof. OK, so uh, now we come to our last proof. So uh, yeah, I've been in this business a long time. I said that every proof teaches you something new. And somehow I had the feeling that my learning curve about this creature has been flattening out. There isn't much more <laughs> that I can learn about this. Or there's always more, but somehow. But this next proof really startled me. So I, I was surprised by, by what I learned from it. So you, you can find this proof in a paper by uh, David Ellis, Nathan Keller, and Noam Lifshitz. And 
It basically, it puts together two things. One is, um, well, one of them, it, it, it appears in a book by Grimmitz, and it reappears in a recent, relatively recent paper of, of uh, Jeff Kahn and Gil Kalai. And you have to put it together with Russo's lemma. And the first talk I ever gave in a combinatoric seminar, seminar as a graduate student, and I talked about a really easy paper where we take KKL and put it together with Russo's lemma. And in the middle of the talk, one of the professors went, so actually, there's nothing here, right? So, <laughs> so this result I'm going to show you. And then, yeah, I said, well, all we're doing is just putting two known results together. That's what we say in the paper. And he said, well, you call those things results. And <laughs> but then uh, Gil, who was my advisor, uh, stepped in and said, no, 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 this is, this is uh, don't sneer at this. So what I'm going to show you now is putting together two known results. But as I said, the, the outcome is, was su surprising to me. So I'm not going to sneer. Um, OK. So first of all, recall, I, that, that, uh, recall this simple fact, that if you have an intersecting family, the number of sets in the family is at most 1 half. So in particular, mu 1 half of A is less or equal to 1 half. Sorry. And we're interested in the question, is mu p of A, we want to compare it to, to p. So let's write mu p of A, this is a definition, as p to some power, alpha of p. So this is the definition of alpha of p. Alpha of p is, and no, so if A was a, we know our, our extreme example is a subcube of co-dimension 1. And what you should think of this is, if A were, if A were a subcube, what would its co-dimension be? P to what power gives you the measure of, of, uh, of A? And we know that uh, alpha of 1 half is equal to 1. We know that the, uh, uh, well, is, is less or equal to 1. We know that if you have an intersecting family, it, when you take the uniform measure, which is mu 1 half, its measure is at most 1 half. So alpha 1 half is le less or equal to 1. And what we want to show is we. Something about your definition, right? Is this the maximal? No, 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 no. For th this is alpha of p and a. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so a is implicit in it. So what we want to show is, a, 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 so prove uh, that, that <laughs> alpha of p is less or equal to p. Um, oh, is, I'm sorry, it's less or equal to 1. And we know it's 1 at 1 half. And, and we need this for, for p in uh, 0, 1 half. One way which, in which could uh, prove that this is true is if alpha of p is uh, just an increasing, uh, increasing function, right? No, decreasing function. Yeah, so is alpha of p decreasing? Very good, Avi. <laughs> OK, so let's say, so let's write what alpha of p is. Alpha of p is a, a log, log of mu divided by log of p, right? So alpha p depends implicitly on a. Mu depends. We're fixing a and looking at the, as everything as a function of p. We fixed, we fixed a for the entire. Uh, for the entire proof, okay. a is fixed, and so a is intersecting. But uh, okay, I don't want to ruin the surprise. Turns out that the, the fact that it's intersecting is way too strong. There's a much weaker hypothesis which uh, implies the outcome. So, alpha prime, we have log squared p. Um, 
mu prime over log mu. Uh, uh, no, sorry. Uh, I can do this. <laughs> One over mu, yeah, mu prime over mu times log p minus log mu over p. Is that okay? What's the derivative of log mu? It's mu prime over mu times log p minus log mu times the derivative of log p, which is 1 over p. Okay, so we, what we, and we want to prove that this is decreasing, so we want to show that uh, log mu divided by p is greater or equal to, so this is a question. Is it true that this is greater than mu prime over mu log p? So is it true? Um, so is it true that mu times log base p of mu is greater or equal to p times mu prime? Question. Uh, do I have this? No, no. I have to change the direction because log, log, log p is a negative number. So what I need is this, right? Didn't you want to show alpha p is increasing? Yeah. Do I um, If it ends less than 1, then it no. should increase. No, no. You want the yeah, equal to increase. No, 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 no. I, if, if, if it, to be less than p, if it's p squared, it's less than p. So if, it's, okay. if alpha is greater than uh, p is smaller than 1, if alpha is, is greater than 1, I'm happy. So it has to go down to 1. I want to show it's decreasing. OK, so um, first of all, let's, let's see what this, ah. So as I said, you want to put two known results together. First of all, uh, this p times uh, mu prime is, uh, is a magnitude that comes up a lot in this area. This is equal by Rousseau's lemma, Rousseau's lemma to the sum of the influences. So what is the sum of the influences? I, I have this function. Let's say I choose all the coordinates except one at random, and then I ask, what is the probability that if I flip this coordinate, the, the value of the function changes? This is for a Boolean function. If it's if it's real function, you have to define it slightly differently. For influence, like in a voting scheme. But right. Everyone is voting at random, but one guy it, it can decide what to vote. What's the probability that he uh, um, can uh, influence the outcome of the election? And i is just the sum of all influences. And it turns out, uh, so this is, this is also, you can think of it, especially when, when p is equal to 1 half, it has to do with the edge boundary of a. I'm precisely asking of a how many edges in the, in the Hamming graph Leave A. How many, if I choose a point at random in A, how many edges leave it? So the, I, each edge is, is counted once for the um, boundary. Uh, and, but you, you want to normalize it and look at the measure. And so what this says, uh, w when P is equal to 1 half, what you get here is that the number of edges, so when p is equal to 1 half, number of edges, number of edges uh, leaving, leaving a is at least the measure of a times the co-dimension of a if a were a subcube log base 2 of 2 to the n divided by the size of a. You so, write mu, two, mu half of a. You mu half of a. Thank you. Or no, maybe I maybe if I'm maybe if I'm counting the number of edges, I just want to 
right, the size of A. So if A is a subcube of co-dimension K, I count the points in A. Each one has K edges leaving it. K uh -huh. is, A will have size 2 to the n minus K, so this will be 2 to the K. The log of that is the co-dimension of A. And this is an ancient, ancient meaning dating back to the 60s, isoparametric inequality. For any set A, the number of edges leaving it is at least what you'd get if A were a subcube. Of course, A can't be exactly a subcube if its size isn't the power of 2, but this is true for any size of A. So this is an isoparametric inequality. If you see this, you say, OK, what's the analogy of this isoparametric inequality if you don't take the uniform measure, but you take the p measure? This is, this is true. This is the uh, isoparametric inequality generalized to any p uh, less or equal to, to 1 half. And this is the result. So this is the result if you put i here and hide this. This is the result of Kanan Kalai or of Grimmett. And if you notice that uh, Rousseau's lemma is, uh, is here, th then, then we're done. We get that uh, the derivative is in, indeed a, a negative, and the function is decreasing. There's only one thing I didn't tell you. For which functions does Rousseau's lemma hold? It, it doesn't hold for any set. It holds for any increasing set or any increasing family. So the big surprise is, for me, the big surprise is if A, if the size of A is at most 2 to the n minus 1 and A is increasing, then mu p of A is at most p. So we said we can assume A is increasing. We know that at 1 half the measure is at most 1 half. But that's all you need. You don't need the fact that A is increasing. It holds for, this is a much more general uh, family of families. And for them, it's also true that mu p of A is at most P. Pardon me? You don't need the fact that, it, that A is intersecting you in the fact that it's increasing. I, I don't you I say you don't need this is this is a theorem if a has at most half of the sets in the cube and it's increasing then mu p of a is at most p in particular if a is intersecting these two things have to hold oh, oh I mean if a is intersecting it's contained in a family for which these two things hold its upset is so that's that's a, that's a surprise for me it was yeah so I depends on p right uh, yeah, of course. Uh, it, you define what like the influences for general p. Uh, well, I, when I defined the influences, I was I said choose a point at random uh, or choose things at random. You're choosing them according to mu p. So, okay, yeah, it, it that's that's a good point. Everything here is in uh, defined. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. <laughs> Pardon me. Oh, just using the fact that uh, it's increasing. No, and I don't think any of the other proofs uh, No, I, I don't know of other proofs of I haven't thought of it a lot, but let's see. I don't know what the, the layer-wise analogy. So for proof number one, I don't see how to do this by going to infinity and back. Uh, Katona, I, I don't know. A Fourier, so I, I had, if you tell me a family is intersecting, I have a very simple statement I can tell you about its Fourier coefficients. The fact that the family is monotone, this is one of the, something that Telegram told me 20 years ago. He said, what do the Fourier coefficients of a monotone function look like? Nobody knows. So uh, there are some results about the, you know, the concentration below zero <laughs> and so on. So. Okay, but uh, but uh, yeah. So that that's 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 pretty weak. You pretty don't yeah. yeah. So yeah. So it seems to me that none of the other proofs give a stronger statement. So. It's, uh,
Ah, yes, because it, it does, it does, because uh, um, <coughs> if, if you want everything to be tight, the derivative has to be zero, and then the isoparametric statement has to be an equality, and it's known that it's an equality only for subcubes. So I in this case, a subcube of co-dimension one. But actually, uh, Ellis, Lifshitz, and, and Keller, they need this also in cases where alpha or some other integer. So you, uh, this, this is a useful thing that can be used in other settings, not only for this uh, modest theorem. No, the, the fact that alpha p is, is, the, is decreasing is true. Uh, yeah, so the answer is yes. Al alpha p is decreasing. If, if you know that, so I have some paper where I proved that something at 1 half is less than 1 eighth. And that took, I don't know, 30 pages. And then we devoted the five more pages to prove that for every smaller p, it's less than p cubed. And then Yuval Filmus gave a talk about this in Rutgers, and Jeff said, but alpha p is uh, decreasing. You could have uh, saved the last five pages. So yeah, so this is a. Uh, well, more questions. What is that product measured where the marginals are different pi? Okay. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, So first, uh, there is a th there is a theorem that then the best you can do is take the most uh, the, the least skew coordinate and and take everything that contains it, and uh, I, I think you can uh, um, the Fourier proof can be uh, tweaked to give that. Uh, I know the other proofs don't naturally uh, encode the fact that it's. Yeah, so I know the Fourier proof with some, with, with some effort can give that. I, I'm not sure about the other proofs. Uh. We probably should say what goes into the, well, it's not like my simple, but the kind of the Kalai. Uh, it's by induction, uh, on, uh, by induction on the dimension. I didn't want to say that because I hate the uh, induction on the dimension. I think uh, a lot of these. Uh, no, so I, I have a, a dimensionless proof of Bechner using entropy. Oh, uh, so the. More questions. All right, thanks. Welcome. Okay.